What is up guys, Blue Spooky here with the Wednesday 2 hour mega mix. That is 2 hours of new true scary stories to this channel, as much as I am able to track. If you guys enjoy this long video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. Doing all of those ensures I can keep making daily videos for a long time to come, especially these longer ones. If you guys have any thoughts about the stories in this video, please be sure to leave them in the comments below. As one of my favorite parts about doing this is reading your guys' comments, even if I don't always get the chance to reply to them. Without further ado though guys, I will let you enjoy the next two hours of True Scary Stories, and I will see you again at the end of the video. Thanks for watching. I used to go out and explore the countryside whenever I could. I would do this just as often alone as with someone else. However, I haven't done it at all since an experience I had with a friend of mine when we were out hiking years ago. Now to be frank, the first thing I have to let you know is that the two of us were hiking in an area we didn't have any right to be in. This was usually the case when we decided to go for a hike. It was always more fun to explore areas like that than it was to go hiking in places known for nature hiking or whatever. It was cool to possibly be seeing something that most people won't normally get to see, and exciting to think about what we might stumble across. This was a hiking trip I took with my buddy Todd, when we were both still in college. We had a week off for spring and we wanted to do some exploring so we took a drive to a very rural area we had found online. Driving up into the hills, we found a convenient area to place our car in that we figured would be a safe spot. Then we hiked out into the woods. We had never actually been in this area before, so we had no set agenda of how we were going to explore, really. We simply started out completely blind, hiking out through the woods. We were pretty high up in the hills when we set out and the area we had parked the car in was actually very dark due to the amount of foliage in the area. It might have seemed a bit creepy at first if we wanted to take it that way. Actually though, there wasn't a whole lot that happened in the first few days. That's not to say we didn't see a lot of things or enjoy ourselves though, just nothing really notable to be scary for someone reading this story. It was on the third night of our trip though that something really strange happened. We had set up our tents and were in them separately. I don't know if Todd had gone to bed yet or not by this point, but I had the impression that he was already fast asleep. I, however, was having a hard time and was staying up reading a book instead. It was around 11 p.m. that night, I believe. All of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a loud and shrill human scream. It cut through the regular sounds of the woods at night and startled me quite a bit. I dropped my book took my flashlight and rushed to get outside my tent. When I got there, Todd was working his way out too. I mentioned I thought he was sleeping. He seemed he was because he was slightly out of it. No sooner than he had worked his way out of the tent, we heard yet another scream cut through the night. More prepared for it this time, we were able to tell which direction it had come from. I was also able to discern that it seemed to be a male screaming as well. It seemed to be coming from a bit of a distance away from us. Todd asked what I thought we should do. I told him I had no idea. He suggested maybe we should try and find whoever was screaming and see if we could try and help them out. I agreed but told him we should bring our knives with us just in case. So, armed with our knives and flashlights, we started out walking in the direction the scream seemed to have come from. I was hoping to hear another sound, regardless of how scary it might be, to try and narrow down where we were supposed to be going. Without any further sounds from the guy we heard screaming, it was really like trying to find a needle in a haystack. We were hesitant to try calling out at first. We had no idea exactly what had been hurting this person and causing them to scream. As we kept fumbling through the woods and trees though, more and more time passed since we'd last heard the person. We realized if we were going to help them out, we would have to hear from them. That meant we had to call out to him, even if it meant risking calling attention to ourselves. I called out a few times. It was terrifying to do so. 
If this person had been hurt by another human or an animal, we could be drawing that entity to us. We were pretty scared with every noise we heard run after. Unfortunately, we did not get any response, and no matter how hard we kept looking, we weren't able to find any trace of anyone in the dark. Worried that we might get lost after too long, we made the tough decision to go back and try to sleep instead. We would get up early the next morning and go out and see if we could find anything in the daylight, any clue as to what had happened. I don't think either of us managed to sleep the whole night though. It was the constant wondering of what we'd just heard, coupled with the feeling that something bad had just happened. The following morning, we went to go and check around once the sun had lit the entire area up. Todd seemed just as worn down as I had. Really, we didn't talk about anything though. We just went and searched the area as best as we could, now that we could actually see what we were doing. I don't know what we were hoping to find, really. I kept fearing we would stumble upon a dead body, someone had been murdered in some brutal way or something. For some reason, I kept focusing on the idea it was probably a person who had injured the man we'd heard and not an animal. It was Todd that eventually found something. He called me over to have a look. We found an area where there was obviously some sort of struggle. On the surrounding ground, surrounding trees, there was blood everywhere. A huge amount of blood. We looked around a little bit more after seeing that, but not for very long. We were too unnerved by the whole discovery. Instead, we went back to our camp and discussed our next options. We decided the best thing to do was to just hike back to the car and move on from there. I'm not going to go into too much depth about that because nothing really happened on the way back. I mean, we had a general sense of unease the entire time, of course. We were nervous and the slightest sound scared us. It was scary, but nothing else really happened. We gave a detailed report to the police, but no idea if anything ever came of it. We gave them our contact information, but we never heard back from them. I'll never forget this really strange house I lived in when I was a teenager. It wasn't for a very long time, and I was pretty thankful for that. That's because some really weird things went on inside that house. This isn't as much of a narrative as it is an explanation, perhaps. I'm sorry if that sort of thing isn't for you, but let me describe the house we lived in. The most important thing to know is that it was a suburban area. There were loads of other houses around, but they weren't piled on top of each other like they are in urban areas. The house was three stories, and it had a basement as well. It wasn't a finished live-in type of basement, though. It was kind of weird, actually. It was very dark, but not really dank. There wasn't a light switch at the top of the steps, either. In order to turn the lights on, you had to go all the way down the steps, and there was a bulb on the ceiling with a chain. The staircase was not complete, either. It was one of those wooden board ones. In the beginning, I never really had a problem with the basement, actually. We kept some of our things stored down there, plus it was sort of an unofficial playroom for us kids. Our toy box for the younger ones was down there. Most of the time, I wasn't really even in it much, so I didn't really give it much more than a passing thought. The first time I had a weird issue with the basement was something that's kind of hard to describe. One of my younger brothers didn't want to go down there by himself to get something, so he asked me if I could instead. I told him I would go with him, but he refused to go down there, even if he was going to be going with me. I didn't really give that too much thought in the moment. I understood it was easy for kids to be scared of such things. I went down into the basement, again not really thinking about anything. I turned the light on and went over to the toy box. As I was sorting through it though, the strangest thing happened. I heard what sounded like someone laughing. I turned around to see if my sister was in the basement, but she wasn't. In fact, I had thought she wasn't even home. Curious, I searched through the entire area. No one was in the basement at all, least of all anybody who could be laughing at me. So, for the first time, I felt a little bit unnerved. It hadn't gotten to a point where it really bothered me much yet, though. A little while later, I did ask my little brother why he didn't want to go into the basement, but he refused to tell me for some reason. He seemed extremely terrified of it, and he was the only one of my siblings who was like that. 
The others didn't seem to have any problem going down there. My dad was the type to force the kids to face their fears, but I wasn't like that really. I didn't want to torment my brother. So, for a while, if he wanted something down there, I would go get it for him instead. My parents were quite strict about toys going back in the box when we were done with them, so one day I had to go put away my brother's toy. I even remember what toy it was. It was a mad scientist dissect an alien. I had no problem though. I went down to the basement, which was dark and a little bit cold actually. I didn't really think too much about that though. I walked down the steps and reached for the chain to turn on the light. Then I went over to the toy box and put the toy away. While I was standing there, once again I heard someone laughing behind me. This time it really bothered me. I'd very clearly heard it, and I knew no one was in the basement with me. For the first time, I actually felt a little bit scared. I decided to get out as quickly as possible. I went over to the stairs. I turned the light off. I was a little hesitant to do that, and almost just wanted to run up the steps. I didn't though. I took my time walking up the stairs to be careful. Keep in mind, it was very dark in the basement. The steps were just bored so I could see behind them, and there wasn't a lot of light. I could just barely see, and what I saw was terrifying. I saw a shadow looking at me from behind the steps, then quickly running away to where I couldn't see them anymore. Scared, I ran up the stairs as quickly as I could. I slammed the door and ran into the kitchen. My little brother was there, and I think he realized just how scared I was. You saw it, didn't you? He asked me. And that was nearly as scary as seeing itself. I was really freaked out, and I finally understood why he didn't want to go down there anymore. For the rest of the time my family lived in the house, my little brother refused to go down in the basement. Regardless of what I had seen, though, I still had to go down there every now and then. I was the big brother, of course, so it was sort of my job to not be scared. I sure was, though, every single time I went down there. My family moved a lot at the time, though, so we weren't there for very long. I was extremely glad when we moved away. If you're in the US, then you know that the weather has been absolutely terrible everywhere lately. Snow in LA, tornadoes in the Midwest, so many storms and they just keep on coming. And the most recent bout of storms brought with it something I'd never thought to be concerned about. I was home alone because my husband works nights. I already don't like that much, as I hate being home alone at night. I often double check the door locks, the windows, and jump at just about every noise. If someone else is home, I'm perfectly fine, but when I'm home alone, I get easily scared. Add to that severe thunderstorms, and the threat of tornadoes when I live in a trailer, and you can imagine my anxiety. The rain was pounding on the roof and windows, and was only drowned out by the cracks of thunder that seemed almost constant. I was reading a book to distract myself, when the power suddenly went out. I swore and put down my book. I sat there, waiting for a moment, hoping the power would come back on, when the booming thunder made me jump. It rolled for what seemed like ages, as I sat there in my chair in the dark, wondering what I was supposed to do now. As the thunder ended, I noticed the night seemed oddly quiet. The wind, the rain, even the thunder were silent now. Was the storm passing? It seemed to be a bit quick for that, though. I was happy to think my power would be restored quicker if the storm ended sooner. I stood up, thinking to get myself a drink, and perhaps prepare for bed as I had nothing to do now. I used my phone as a flashlight and was walking toward the kitchen, marveling at the oddly quiet night. That was when I heard something distinctly not a part of the storm. It began low and quiet, and quickly ramped up into a piercing wail. I froze in place. The tornado siren. I didn't stay frozen for long. I ran into my bedroom and hunkered down in my walk-in closet. I didn't feel safe, though. All my life, I had heard about what tornadoes do to trailer parks, and though I was deep in the closet, I was just imagining a tornado picking up the entire trailer. Me being tucked away in the closet wasn't going to do anything about that. It'd just throw me around. I suddenly realized that though I'd lost power, I hadn't lost everything. 
I had my phone and decided to actually use it for one thing I rarely use my phone for. I called my husband. I was panicking and barely got out two sentences before he said, why don't you go to the shelter? I had completely forgotten our neighbors at a small tornado shelter nearby. They'd mentioned it a few times, and it wasn't all that far away. In my panic, it had completely slipped my mind. My neighbors were only in town on occasion, as their house here was their vacation house. I knew they weren't in town now, though, and expressed this to my husband. He told me they never locked it, though. It was a storm shelter, and they wanted to make sure anyone could get to it in case of an emergency. I hung up and stood to leave the closet. It sounded quiet outside, except for the siren. I quickly went to the door, slipped on my shoes, and went outside. It didn't seem to be raining, either. I heard no thunder and saw no lightning, but I could feel it in the air. Something very ominous. I turned the flashlight back on my phone and carefully walked down the porch steps. I walked quickly through my neighbor's yard. The shelter was a small structure, partially buried in the ground. As I reached for the door, the wind picked up and I felt the strangest thing. The rain began again, quickly, but it wasn't normal rain. It wasn't falling like normal. It was completely horizontal. I had heard of this, but experiencing it was something else entirely. I jerked open the door and ran inside, slamming it behind me. It was only upon reaching the bottom of the stairs, soaked from the sudden downpour if you could call it that, that I realized there was a light on, and I wasn't there alone. For half a second, I expected to see my neighbor there, or even another neighbor of ours using the shelter, as it had been left open for all of us. The shelter was small, though, just a single room no bigger than the average bedroom. Across the room, just feet away, lying on the built-in bench against the wall, was a man I'd never seen before. There were items strewn about him on the floor, and I knew he'd been living here for a while. He glared at me from the bench, setting up with the blankets hanging off his head and making him look like some perverse hobo nun. I stood at the foot of the stairs, frozen with uncertainty. A loud rumble of thunder reminded me why I had come down there, though. I forced myself to calm down. I had met homeless people around here before. There was no reason to immediately assume the man was dangerous. After all, he needed a place to stay during a tornado, too. And here was an unlocked shelter just waiting to be used. Uh, hi? He just stared at me. I couldn't move from the foot of the stairs. I very much wanted to run back up them and into my house, but the roar from outside kept me from doing so. I was hearing the wind, and it sounded like a freight train. I'd heard it said before, but only now I realized it wasn't just being poetic. It sounded like the roar of an oncoming train muffled only by the fact I was underground. The man continued to glare at me, a look of utter hatred in his eyes. Look, I'm sorry to disturb you, but this is a tornado and this is my friend's shelter, I explained. The man suddenly stood up. This is my house, he shouted, raising an arm and pointing at nothing. I know you've been staying here, I began, but he continued shouting, staggering towards me. It's my house. Mine. Get out! There's a tornado out there, I shouted back, not at all sure where I got the courage from. I was standing at the foot of the stairs, and I could hear the wind behind me. The sounds were stressing the metal. Get out! Get out! He shouted over and over again, as he staggered toward me. I didn't know what to do. It wasn't like I could leave. There was a tornado going on outside. This man was coming at me, though. My eyes shot around the room for any sort of weapon, but there was nothing within reach. The man was much bigger than me, but his staggering gait made me think for a moment I could take him. He grabbed me with his strong hands, though, and all my pushing had no effect. Let go of me, I shouted. He just constantly shrieked to get out. He began trying to drag me up the stairs. He was going to throw me out into the tornado. I punched him hard across the face and screamed. There's a fucking tornado, you moron! This only made him more angry as he returned the slap hard. It hurt like hell, but I realized he was only holding me with one hand now. I wrenched myself from his grasp and lunged toward the other side of the room. I tripped and fell, but I kept scrambling, trying to grab anything I could use as a weapon. My hand fell on something long and hard. It felt like wood. As he stood over me and reached down to try and pick me up and drag me out again, I swung the object at his head, and completely missed, of course. He wrenched it from my hand and threw it away, 
then picked me up. He tried to throw me over his shoulder, but I was having none of it. I struggled and kicked, and he had to half carry and half drag me to the door, all the time alternating between muttering my house and screaming get out. I was doing my best to make things difficult for him. I didn't want to be out in this storm. I didn't want to die in a tornado for some crazy man hiding in my friend's shelter. I kicked and screamed, struggled and scratched. One arm was at my chest and the other at my throat. I started to feel like I was choking. He was wearing a filthy shirt and he reeked. For some reason, this is what I thought before I squirmed my way into a position to bite his arm hard. I sank my teeth in as deep as I could. He howled and dropped me. I slid down the stairs, and he shouted and cursed, shaking his arm. As I reached the bottom, I quickly crawled to the far end of the room. I was terrified of what he would do to get back at me for that. I also wanted to be as far away from that door in the tornado as I could get. When I reached the other side of the room and turned around, he hadn't followed me down the stairs, though. Instead, he was standing there staring at me, glowering like he had been before. He was holding his wounded arm in the other hand. Suddenly, he turned, and with the roar of the wind, he opened the door and stepped out into the tornado. I was shocked. I sat on the bench furthest from the stairs and stared up at the now open door. I couldn't see anything but darkness, and the rain was now flowing down the steps. I huddled on the bench in the corner, staying away from the man's belongings. I didn't know if he was dead or if he'd ever be back, but I didn't want to touch them either. The wind and the siren filled the night, and a small waterfall formed on the stairs from the sheer rain. After a few minutes, though, it all died down. I sat there, lightly touching my face where he'd slapped me. I realized he could come back and be armed, much angrier as well. I grabbed the wooden object I'd tried to hit him with before. I was surprised. It was a wooden lucky cat statue, and it was also mine. Usually, it just sat on my front porch but it had suddenly disappeared a few weeks ago. I thought it had gotten blown away in a previous storm or something, but it hadn't been blown away. The man had taken it. He'd been here for weeks, living in this shelter, mere yards from my house. A chill ran through me as I realized this. Part of me felt bad for him with him being homeless, but that didn't mean he wasn't dangerous. I realized I hadn't locked the door when I left my house to go to the shelter. He could have gone there, I clutched the cat to me and stood up to grab my phone that I now realized I'd dropped during the struggle. I picked it up off the floor and flipped it over, delighted to see it was getting a signal. Not much of one, but it was something. I called my husband and stayed in the shelter until he came home. Thankfully, there were no strange people in our house, which was still in one piece. The tornado had hit nearby, but it was a bit south of us, and thankfully there wasn't much damage. It seemed no one had been hurt. There was no sign of the man, though. I think my neighbors should be locking the shelter from now on. I know I'll feel much less foolish when I triple-check my locks now. You never know who could be out there, just a few steps from your front yard. This happened during the summer of 2015. I had just graduated high school, and I still lived in my hometown at that time. I was out with some friends, and it was getting really late in the evening, around 1am or so. I decided it was around time to head home. First, though, I had to stop by a drugstore close to my house that was 24-7 to pick up some aspirin and snacks. The one I went to was in the same parking lot as a supermarket, which is important. I parked my car as close to the store as possible. It was quite empty, so there were no more than two other cars in this giant lot. I was nowhere near either of them. I headed in and grabbed what I came to get very quickly. I just had this overwhelming feeling of dread the whole time, for seemingly no reason. I felt like someone was constantly watching me, but when I looked around, I couldn't see anyone else there. Well, besides me and the cashier. After I had gotten everything I intended to buy, I stalled checking out for a bit. I went aisle by aisle, looking at random things. I thought, just in case, whoever was out there would surely get bored and leave if I took too long looking around. Really though, the whole time I thought I was just being paranoid. 
I wasn't used to going out so late, so surely that must be it. After about 20 minutes of that wandering around, I paid for my items and left the store. I got to the door and literally bolted to my car, pepper spray in hand. I locked myself in immediately. I turned my head to check the back seat. Just before, I was about to breathe a sigh of relief because no one really was there. I heard a sudden tapping on my window. I looked around before I'd left the store near the entrance, and I'd seen that no one was nearby, so how had I not seen whoever was tapping out there? Of course, this really freaked me out. I don't know if this person was Ted Bundy inspired or what, but this was quite an odd occurrence. I looked up to see a very handsome blonde man with slightly long hair and a big cast on his arm. My first instinct was to drive off immediately, but this man was leaning on the front hood part of my car. I didn't want to just run him over and get in trouble or something, so I rolled my window down just an inch. I called out to him and asked him to maybe back up just a bit so I could drive off without hitting him, but no, he stayed glued to my car. The man then asked me if I could help him with directions and to look up an address for him. Uh, I really need to go right now, sir. Maybe you can ask the person in the drugstore and they can help. I already went to the supermarket and they said they couldn't do anything. Well, that was a big mistake. I knew that place closed at exactly 8pm. There was no way this guy had just been lurking around for five whole hours, waiting for some random girl's help. He then went on and on about feeling really tired. If I could just give him some water or food I'd bought since he had no money, that would be a great help. I told him okay and began to reach to my passenger side to grab the chips I had bought. I started to roll the window down slightly, and like I expected, he moved closer to my window. It was all part of my plan though. Now he was off the hood of my car. I slammed on the gas. He chased my car as it started to pull out and I heard a scraping sound on the side as I pulled away. I didn't drive directly home just in case I was followed. Instead, I drove down the highway for an hour. I was so distraught over what just happened. When I finally got home, the entire side of my car had been scraped from the door almost to the trunk. I'm pretty sure he used a knife or some other sharp object because it was a really rough scrape. Of course, I immediately reported the incident but they never found that man or heard of any similar incidents in my town. He was watching me the entire time, perhaps from the windows of the store. How else would he have known I'd brought food with me? I think maybe he had hidden behind my car so I couldn't see him when I came out at first. I feel like he was trying to get me before I got in my car, but I was too scared and happened to get in too fast for him to act. I would like to share my experience with you all, as it was something that made me change into who I am today. Some info just before that though. I'm a Brazilian guy, 20 years old today, but I was around 12 or so when this story happened. Just a normal school day, boring subjects, annoying people, you know, the usual. I come from a good family with a somewhat good financial situation, so at the time, I had with me a Motorola V3 cell phone. That was like top tier back in the day, and it was really uncommon for the other kids to have one. Every day after school, it would take a while for my father to pick me up with his car, which used to be a silver Mariva. That was also the same car he would drive me to school with. One day, I was waiting for my dad to come pick me up, so I was playing some new Super Mario Bros on my DS which of course I took to school with me. And that's when I heard my cell phone ring, and I heard the voice of a somewhat cheery man. Hey Pete, it's your Uncle Paul. I'm here to pick you up for Dad. Come outside. I simply answered with okay and left through the gate. Thing is, it was still fairly early, way earlier than my dad usually picks me up. When I thought about that, I went back inside and waited for another call, and it came pretty fast. Where are you? The man asked. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I don't see you. He breathed a heavy sigh and began to give me some instructions. 
I'm with the same blue Corolla that I dropped you today in the morning, Pete. Come on. He hung up. He was getting impatient. My 12-year-old brain processed what was happening and connected the dots. The thing is, I had no uncles with a name that started with P. Also, it couldn't be my mom's brother either because he'd been dead for quite a while now. No one called me Pete either but my family, being my brother, sister, and my parents. I started to get a bit nervous and talk to my friends about this. After all, some of them were still there. Basically, all they said was, yeah, dude, that's really sketch. Now, I'm not one to usually take charge myself, so instead I went to the principal for help. On the way there, the man called again, and I picked up. This time, he was angry. Why the fuck are you taking so long, you son of a bitch? Blue Corolla, are you brain dead? Get out here with that stupid video game of yours. Then he hung up. Instantly, I froze, and many thoughts began to rush through my head. Is this a kidnapper or something? Is this a prank? I started running to the principal's office. I was getting nervous, so I called my dad. He answered in a hurry, and I took a deep breath to not seem scared. Hey, uh, Dad, did you by chance send someone named Paul here to pick me up? My heart was pounding to hear what I wanted. No. Whoever's calling you, don't go outside. I'll be right there. He hung up after. I went into the office building, bursting in tears, asking for someone to get the man that was probably out there waiting for me in a blue Corolla. I gave the teacher and the principal the number he was calling me from, and they called as well to no avail. They decided to go outside together and check this blue Corolla by themselves. I stayed behind in the office, as I got more calls. This time I picked up. My hands were shaking, but I knew at least now he could not harm me. What's taking you so long, you little shit? He screamed. Listen, I know you're no uncle of mine. You have no idea which car I come to school in. You're trying to kidnap me or something. I'm not going out there. He whispered something quietly. I couldn't hear him, so I screamed and called him sick and crazy. Again. You're not coming out again. You've been out. You just know better. Fuck you. He screamed before laughing like a maniac and hanging up. I held the phone in my hands and stared at nothingness for a while. The teacher and principal came back in saying there was no blue Corolla outside. Shortly after, my dad arrived, and I was escorted to a taxi with him and the guards. I sat there and did nothing, as my dad talked on the phone to track the number that had been calling and find this person by the name of Paul. I took the rest of the week off school, and eventually I started to have nightmares about being outside and being grabbed. After this all happened, I did go back the next week, and instantly joined the kendo club in order to know something about self-defense especially if I got the chance to be armed with something. Years later, my mom and dad divorced. I saw that coming, though. After all, when this episode happened, I was living with my older brothers because they didn't want to involve me in all their fights. Once I came back home with my mom, though, I found out they had divorced because my father had five lovers in five different places. Some of them had even tried to harass my mother. That made me wonder. Could all of this kidnapping story have been a scheme from one of these lovers to steal my dad from us? If it was, that just makes me uncomfortable to know a human being is capable of killing someone's kid just to get what they want. Good thing is, I'm 20 today and I've never heard from that Paul again. I still wonder though what would have happened to me if I'd lapsed a bit and didn't have the knowledge to go back inside and kept looking for that person instead. From 2006 to 2008, I was a student at a university in England, studying paramedic science. This course was a two-year fast track into becoming a qualified paramedic and EMT. The course involved placements at various points throughout both years. First, we spent an evening slash night in a dispatcher's. I'll never forget some of those calls, like a man waking up in bed next to his wife only to find she died during the night. Next, we were stationed with the patient transport service, taking patients to their hospital appointments when they couldn't get there alone. 
And finally, after waiting a good six months for the opportunity, it was time to spend a prolonged placement with the 999 cruise. You could choose a couple of preferred locations, and I was fortunate enough to be given the ambulance station close to my own home. Because of this, I moved back to my parents' home that winter for a full term, leaving my university buddies behind. In hindsight, I really wish I hadn't. The station was in Buxton, Derbyshire. Google map it, it's middle of nowhere territory. It's also 45 minutes from the nearest hospital, so you better not get hurt badly up there. Only, of course, people did. So one evening, we respond to a call where a guy has come off his bike on the Cat and Fiddle Run. It's named after a pub by the same name on that road, which passes over the Pennines, a set of mountains. Bikers love to bomb it up and down. It's notorious. Guy broke a brick wall with his body. Legs were over his shoulders. We took him with blue lights to the aforementioned hospital, and I don't think he survived. This is where things got very messed up. We turn out of our hospital, travel maybe half a mile, and get flagged down by this pedestrian. She shouted through the window that somebody had been badly beaten. We later found out this was the case of somebody bumping into somebody else in a bar, nothing more. In that exact moment, a guy in a red shirt kind of stumbled out from a side street and collapsed into the road. I had been in the rear passenger seat of the patient compartment, with my mentor and her technician riding up front. They got out before me to help him, whilst I opened the side bay. Stupidly, I climbed out as my mentor helped him in. That's the point when I noticed two things. This man was not wearing a red t-shirt. He was topless and was saturated head to waist in his own blood. And now I realized there was a mob of people rushing straight towards us. Ten, maybe even as many as fifteen. I can't exactly remember. I was still outside the ambulance and was pretty much frozen in terror. I was only nineteen at this point and still kind of a pussy. Thankfully, my mentor hauled me inside and locked the doors instantly. She turned back to me, asking if the rear door was locked. It was not. They opened it from the outside. My mentor pushed them back, and I couldn't believe it, started to heckle them, telling them to pick on a group of people and not just one man. She managed to kick them out and lock the door herself. What happened next will stick with me forever, clearly as I'm telling the story nearly ten years on. The people surrounded us and began to try and flip the ambulance over. Meanwhile, another guy started hammering the side window. He shattered it and even cut himself wide open with blood spraying everywhere, but he kept on going. They were like animals. There was a window between the rear and the front cabin. We could see a police car fast approaching. He didn't stop though and continued straight past. I don't really blame him for not wanting to take on 15 people all by himself though. Only later did I find out that the keys were still in the ignition as well. Nobody attempted to enter the cabin through sheer luck. After a while, the violent hooligan mob dispersed, but not before leaving a lasting mark on my psyche. You ever have one of those older brothers who likes to pull mean pranks on you and tries to scare you to death? You know the type I'm talking about shortly. The kind of brother who tries to convince you a monster is under your bed or the boogeyman lives inside your closet. Do you know anyone who had an older brother like that? Well, I didn't have one. I had a younger brother who was like that. My little brother Tommy was not only three years younger than me but also a very tiny thing. Physically, he was not threatening in the least, but mentally, he had an imagination that could scare the shit out of people three or four times his age. The worst thing he ever tried to do to me happened when we lived in a house in a new subdivision. After we'd all moved in, all four of us kids got our own room for the first time in our lives. Being the second oldest, I got the second choice of bedrooms. The room that I picked was not only the second biggest, but also had another feature I really enjoyed. It was very unique to the other rooms in the house. There was this trap door in the closet that led underneath the house. It was actually kind of weird, but I thought it was really neat. 
This trap door led to what you might call a crawl space, I suppose. It wasn't really shallow enough that you would have to crawl in it, though. A human being could very easily stand straight up and underneath the house with nary a problem. My brother Tommy just loved the idea of that trap door. He was actually quite mad at me for getting what he felt like was the most interesting feature in the entire house. Now, about a month after we'd moved in, he was still trying to get me to trade rooms with him so he could have the trap door in his closet. After that month of refusing, I suppose he finally snapped and got angry with me. Fine, if you don't want to trade rooms with me, then I'll leave you and Matilda alone, he told me. With that, Tommy turned and began to leave the room. Although I should have known better, I had to ask Tommy what the hell he was talking about. I'm talking about Matilda, Tommy replied. She's a homeless woman who lives in the crawl space. Actually, she was squatting in the house before we moved in. Once we showed up, she had to hide underneath. I figured I'd be nice and try to take this room off your hands since I'm not as big a chicken as you are. But I suppose if you want her, you can stay in the room where she has the most direct access to the house. With that, Tommy turned and swiftly left the room. I had to give it to my little brother. He had outdone himself this time. While this story did indeed give me the creeps though, I knew it was just his attempt to get me to trade bedrooms with him, and I was not about to give in. Well, Tommy didn't give in either. He began to taunt me on a daily basis about this Matilda lady. He described her as an ugly, fat old hag lady dressed in ratty blue dresses. He told me he would often talk to her, and she told him she would sneak up into the house when the family wasn't home to grab food. She would then take it back into the crawl space. She would cook it over an open fire. Tommy told me that he told Matilda how much he wanted my room, and once even asked her if she would help him get it from me. According to Tommy, she'd readily agreed she would help scare me out of the room, but she had to pick the time, not him. I suppose it was a brilliant tactic on the part of my brother. It really left it open-ended as to when this imaginary woman would come attack me. This was his attempt to keep me on edge all the time. My brother was very smart after all, like I told you. When I still didn't budge though, my brother stepped up his torment. He started doing something to me every night before bedtime. He would taunt me, singing about how she lived in the crawl space through my door. Even though I really didn't believe him, it did unnerve me as I laid there in bed. I would always sneak a glance over at that closet and that trap door. As I went to sleep, I heard the voice of my little brother in my head. As he whispered over and over about how she lived in the crawl space. My brother's head games did begin to work, but I still didn't want to give in to him. In fact, it just had the opposite effect. I was even more determined to resist. It kind of made me mad he'd found such an effective way to get into my head. About a week after my brother had his little taunts, he came to my room again and was bugging me once more about Matilda. Right in the middle of his little game, though, we suddenly heard a noise. Tommy froze up and then slowly turned and looked over to the trap door. What the hell? He asked, fear appearing on his face for the first time maybe in his life. The moment he said it, I looked over and saw the trap door begin to lift up a bit. Tommy jumped, and I scrambled up onto my bed. Holy shit, what the fuck? Tommy screamed and jumped up with me. Oh my god, that must be Matilda, I shouted. He looked at me confused. Dude, what the hell are you talking about? You know I made that up just to get this room, right? I looked over to Tommy, then back over to the now lifting trap door. Well, then what the hell is that? Before either of us could answer, the trap door banged again. Tommy ran to the other side of the bedroom and cowered in fear. My little brother, the king of horror, cowered away in the corner. Tommy, I I'm gonna go check it out, okay? I told my little brother as I hopped off the bed. I slowly and cautiously began to walk over to the trap door. Don't! I'm sorry I tried to scare you, but don't go over there! I didn't listen. You're my little brother and it's my job to protect you, I told him. If someone's down there, I have to find out what's going on. Tommy actually began to cry as I approached the trap door. With every bit of caution, I leaned over. With every bit of caution, I leaned over. I slowly reached my hand out in order to grab the brass ring on top of the door 
and pulled that trap door open. As I did so, the door was thrust open in my hands. A hand reached out and grasped my wrist. I began to scream, and as I did, the hand pulled onto me. It was holding me tight, and it would not let me go. Tommy was still screaming and crying, and started screaming for our parents to come help. Well, the noise and the commotion caused my parents to sprint into the room. They saw what was going on. My mom ran over to Tommy and held him tight. My dad came over and fully pulled open the trap door. Revealing our older brother Joseph standing in the crawl space with a big dumb grin on his face. Holding my arm, my dad looked over to me and saw a grin on my face as well. Remember when I said I didn't have an older brother who would torment and scare me? Well, I didn't, but that night Tommy sure did. I recently moved to Colorado because I've always heard such stories about its beauty, and I've always been a really big fan of nature. Well, the fact that they legalized pot in the past few years really didn't hurt either, but that's kind of beside the point. I honestly had never seen the Rocky Mountains before, and I wanted to experience all the wonders of nature that John Denver was so ecstatic about that he had to write all those songs. Well, I wasn't disappointed. Colorado had a lot to appreciate. In addition to the mountains and forests and everything else, I also noticed that Colorado has a lot of tunnels as well. I mean, I suppose it does make sense. When you have so many mountains, you have to have a lot of tunnels too. I was particularly fascinated, however, with the train tunnels. Unlike car tunnels, train tunnels are not particularly well lit, and they're only really thin enough for the train to go through. There's a minor ledge on the side for a person to be up on just in case they're in there with the train, but other than that, there's really not much room. For some reason, I had become fascinated with these tunnels. I really wanted to try and walk through one of them, just to see what it would be like, you know? They were very old, looking like they had been constructed in the 19th century for all I knew. I just found them really fascinating. Now, before I go any further, I need to tell you what happens. This story has nothing to do with the actual train. I didn't accidentally go into the tunnel when a train was supposed to be coming, then run to the exit, only to just get out of there in the nick of time or something. Beforehand, I actually looked up the schedule online and was able to find a good period when there were no scheduled trains running for almost the entire day. And that was the perfect time for me to go and explore. This tunnel I was going to was a particularly long one as well. Getting there was a little bit difficult even. Although there were no barriers, there was a lot of traffic on the interstate, and it went all throughout the mountains, of course. I was headed towards this tunnel in the middle of day, so I didn't have the cover of darkness to conceal me. I also wasn't brave enough to try and sneak into a tunnel at night. Instead, I put on an orange hazard vest, I wanted to at least try and make it look like I belonged there. I got to the tunnel without much incident and held my breath as I went to venture in. It was really neat and really light at first. As I mentioned though, this is a really long tunnel and there isn't really much lighting in the middle. Once I was far enough away from the entrance, it was pitch dark. I had brought along a flashlight but I sort of wanted to see how long I could walk before it got so dark I couldn't see anymore. As I started walking down the tunnel and into the mountain, the light behind me got dimmer and dimmer. I knew I had almost a day's worth of time, so I wasn't in a particular hurry. Eventually, after a bit of winding, I was in the pitch black. It was pretty awesome, I have to tell you. I took out my flashlight and shone it along as I went on. It was so dark that that puny little beacon of light barely made an impact. As I continued walking in this silent darkness beside my footsteps, I heard a noise a bit off into the tunnel. It sounded like someone else was walking as well, but I doubted that could possibly be the case. I mean, what are the chances that someone else was walking this far into the train tunnel at the same time I was? Only a few moments later though, I began to hear it again. It definitely sounded like some sort of footsteps and it was coming from the direction I was walking toward. I wondered if this might be an animal or something. I began to get concerned. I didn't know all the wildlife that was in Colorado, 
and I was walking through a narrow tunnel deep into a mountain. It was not going to be easy to get away unless I was able to find a ring to turn me invisible. I considered turning around and going back because I kept hearing that sound over and over. As I stood there and tried to listen a bit closer, I began to hear what was definitely the clacking sound of shoes. It was coming from even deeper inside. I was in a bit of a quandary here. The ledge I was walking on was not particularly wide, so if I turned around and began to walk away out of the tunnel, I would be turning my back completely on what could potentially be a dangerous person. It would be very difficult to defend myself if I were to be attacked. If I kept walking forward though, I could simply be presenting myself to them. I really didn't know what to do now. I stood there waiting, feeling like time was going on and on. I heard the footsteps coming slowly closer and closer. I still wasn't sure what to do. Finally, I took my flashlight and tried to shine it deeper down into the tunnel. It took several moments to notice, but I finally saw a figure approaching through the darkness. It was a hunched over person whose face looked very morose with his eyes completely closed. It was a pale gray color, but I figured that might just be because of the darkness. I stood there frozen as he continued to get closer and closer. Eventually, he stopped in place, and then the most terrifying thing happened. He moved his head, and I realized that was not his head at all. He was holding what looked like a decapitated head in front of him. At least, there was a large bag that had a similar shape that he was holding. He smiled at me with his eyes still closed and called out, Hey, you want to join my head collection? I turned around and booked it out of that tunnel like he would not believe. I have no idea if the man tried to follow me, but even if he did, he was much smaller and older than I was. I really doubted he would be able to keep up. In that moment, I didn't particularly care either. I just ran and ran and didn't stop until I not only reached the end of the tunnel, but sprinted through the opening, got to my car, and drove off onto the interstate. I really don't know what the hell that was, or how that man seemed to get a human head, but I know I'll never go wandering into train tunnels ever again. This isn't a particularly long story, but it is easily the scariest thing that's ever happened to me in my entire life. When I was a younger child, I was deathly afraid of the typical things. Monsters in my closet or something hiding underneath my bed. I would always have to check both of them before going to sleep, so much so that it became a daily routine. I would go over, open the closet door, have a good look around, and then close and latch it. Afterwards, I would go over, kneel down in front of my bed, and peer underneath. After I confirmed that there was nothing there, I would turn off the light and hurry over to my bed, which was placed up against the wall. I would keep myself against the wall until I fell asleep. Of course, I always felt silly in the morning, and promised myself I would not do it again the next night. Regardless, when the next night rolled around, there again I would be. I was about 11 years old, when, for the first time, I had a friend over to spend the night. My parents had this weird rule that we couldn't have friends stay overnight until we reached the age of 11. I don't really know why that specific age, but anyway, my friend Kevin and I watched some scary movies after my parents went to bed. When we were done, he went to my room. He put a big sleeping bag on the floor right next to my bed. It was a sleepover, so we weren't really planning on going to sleep just then. He laid down and started chatting as I was laying on my bed and he in his bag. Suddenly, he got up, went over, and turned out the light. I actually felt a bit of a jolt go through me, because I hadn't expected him to do that. As Kevin got back into his bag and we continued to chat, I found that doing so had become somewhat strained. For the first time since I could remember, I was in my room in the dark, without having checked either the closet or under the bed for intruders. Of course, the fact that we had watched scary movies really didn't help either. While we laid there in the dark talking, Kevin seemed to realize I was really tense. He made some bad gay joke that I was scared he was going to make a move on me, and we both laughed a bit together. 
I tried to relax for a while and keep chatting, but it wasn't long before Kevin had drifted off and stopped responding. Laying there awake and somewhat alone now was a bit frightening to me. I tried to just close my eyes and go to sleep, but it was too difficult. I knew I had to do my routine or I would not be getting any sleep that night. Of course, I couldn't turn the light on without Kevin waking up. I had a little book light on my nightstand though, so I grabbed it and moved out. I listened to Kevin's snores as I hopped off the bed very lightly. I crept over to the closet, making as little noise as I could. I turned the doorknob very slowly until I heard it click open. Opening it a bit, I shone the book light into it and confirmed it was indeed empty. I closed the door and made my way back over to the bed. I crawled up onto it because I figured I could just lean over and peer underneath. I took the light and slowly looked over the side only to find myself looking into the eyes of a little boy hiding under my bed. I jumped in fright and dropped the book light on the floor. Kevin, of course, came out from underneath, laughing his ass off at me. Heaving from under the bed, he told me he was sorry, but he just couldn't resist when he'd woken up and saw me checking out the closet. He just had to try and scare me. I appreciated that, I mean, that's what male friends do to each other. Still, I asked him to turn the light on for me so I could calm down a little bit. He got up, went over to the light, and flipped it on. When Kevin looked back at me, though, he turned as white as a sheet. I followed his gaze toward the foot of my bed to see what had scared him. There was a little girl our age standing at the foot of the bed in a nightgown. I couldn't see her face for some reason. She was quiet for a moment, then said, I'd like to play. The lights went out, and then, when they came back on, she was just gone. Kevin stood there for a moment before asking if he could sleep in the same bed tonight. Yes was my only reasonable response. I'd woken up in the middle of the night, but I wasn't quite sure why yet. Not only did I work 12-hour shifts during the day, which obviously weared me out, but I was one of those really deep sleepers, even when my alarm clock would wake me up. It took me a little while to realize that it was indeed my alarm clock going off. Even then, I had a really hard time shaking the grogginess. After a few moments, I realized my daughter was standing on the side of my bed, trying to wake me up apparently. I fumbled around for my glasses, but I couldn't find where they were, couldn't remember where I'd left them either. She was tugging on my sleeve, so I gave up finding them immediately. My wife was out of town, so I had the whole bed to myself. Somehow, I rolled all the way over onto the other side. I was so exhausted, I didn't want to do anything. I just gave up and asked my daughter what was wrong. There's a ghost in my room, she told me fear evident in her voice. If my wife had been home, she would have let her climb into bed with us. I, however, really didn't like that kids have to get over being scared of the dark. That was not going to happen if parents continued to baby them and indulge their fantasies about ghosts and monsters. Sweetie, there's no such thing as ghosts, I told her. You need to go back to bed. Daddy has to work in the morning and you can't go to school all tired either. But there's a ghost in my room, I swear there is! I groaned. I didn't believe this sort of nonsense, and I wasn't happy my daughter was obviously believing it either. I rolled over and managed to pull myself up to a seated position. Sweetheart, it's not true. Whatever's in your room is just your imagination. Now, go back to bed. My daughter stopped for a moment and seemed to think about what I just said to her. Okay, Dad, could you at least check my room for me to make sure? I supposed it would be the best way for me to get back to sleep. If I check your room out, will you go back to bed? I promise, she told me. I humped up out of bed and went out of my room and into the hallway. I felt like I was almost drunk as I stumbled around. I was so exhausted I could barely even walk straight. The only thing I knew was that when I got back to bed, I might never wake up again with how tired I was. When we got to the room, my daughter jumped into bed and got onto the blankets. Check in the closet, please. Slowly, I made my way over, 
Grabbing the door, I rolled it open and looked inside. Of course, there was nothing there. I let her know this. She seemed very pleased. Okay, check under the bed too. Will you go to bed right after I do? I asked her. She promised, so I staggered over, grabbed the side of the bed to steady myself, and when I had the leverage I needed, I lowered myself down and peeked under the bed. Much like I had expected, there was nothing there. I was about to straighten myself back up when the grogginess started to clear up a little bit, and suddenly I realized something. My daughter had gone with my wife to visit her parents, and I was supposed to be in the house alone. I felt like my heart stopped as I thought back to that character now on the bed. I quickly jumped up to my feet, only to see that no one was there anymore. Nervous now and just a little bit scared, I jumped away. I half expected someone to reach out and grab my leg or something. Shakily, I made my way back to my bedroom. I turned all the lights on, because I'll admit, I was pretty scared. I repeated the same routine I'd done in my daughter's room. Checked under my bed, in the closet. I checked everywhere else as well. Nothing to be found. I slept with the light on that night. When my wife got home, I told her what had happened, and she got a pretty good chuckle out of making fun of me. Now, whenever my daughter comes to my room claiming she's seen a ghost or a monster, I just let her crawl into bed with me. I just remembered a fun encounter that might serve as a warning to those working late at night. I was 24 at the time this happened, working in a nightclub about a 10 minute walk from my home. I used to close on Tuesday nights slightly earlier than the other nights, as it was generally our slowest night of the week, closing at around 12am instead of keeping customers until 2.30. Usually I'd be the only one left, as I'd start cutting staff as the night went on. Since it was a slower day of the week, we didn't have security on either. About two months in of regularly closing at 12am, I was walking home. I used to bring some bulkier clothes to hide my figure when leaving alone, as I'd been followed and chased home many times before. In fact, we'd often get men waiting after hours just for the girls to come out, knowing we'd eventually have to after closing. I didn't want to attract attention to myself. I also used to walk home, as I didn't have a car at that time. I'd had a few weird experiences with Uber drivers not actually taking me home. It's surprising how often fake cabs try to show up or the drivers just harass you until you pretend to show interest or give them some way of contacting you. Uber just gives you a $5 coupon for all the trouble. I guess that's a story for another time, though. The bar was located along a main road that was home to the majority of the other bars and restaurants in the city downtown as well. Often at this time, I'd see about a handful of people around. The streets were generally pretty empty, though. I was walking along when I noticed a parked car about a block away. The driver turned and looked at me. Then you turned around to be on the same side of the street as me. Now he was catcalling me, trying to get me to come into his car. I didn't engage, of course, and simply kept on walking. We were maybe a block or two past the initial spot I'd seen him, and he was still slowly driving along the sidewalk. I would have crossed the street, but I didn't have to want to get anywhere near his car. He kept this up until about the halfway mark, when he took off in his car and I was relieved he was now gone. But of course, that wasn't it. Guess who comes blasting back down the road? He did. Now my walk turned into a jog, which then turned into me full-on running. I was running behind closed bars and businesses, trying to find a back route to get home without him seeing where I lived. He followed me for so long that at one point I was even running through bushes and mud. No matter what street I would end up on, his car would always be waiting for me. Eventually, I happened to run right in front of his car while it was parked on the side street beside my place. I ran into my house to the back entrance. The back entrance was obscured by plenty of trees, cars, and the surrounding houses. There were multiple unit homes as well, so I was confident he hadn't seen what door I'd gone in through. Fast forward to the following Tuesday, and I'm walking home once more. Guess whose car was parked exactly at the halfway mark? This went on for the next four weeks. 
except as time went on, he started parking closer on the street to the front of my house each time. I begged my manager to take me off closing that specific shift. The last time I saw him, one of the apartment buildings along the way had a few cop cars and cops standing around the entrance. I stayed with them when he tried to follow me, which led to him driving off for that night. A week passed by and I was no longer on that shift. A co-worker of mine sent me a news article via text. I opened it and saw that the man who had been following me was arrested for doing this to multiple girls in the city, all along the street my work was on and that I lived on. He'd gotten caught because he'd followed a university student all the way to her house and wouldn't drive away. She called the cops and he was still there by the time they came to arrest him, surprisingly. He got out the next day, I believe, and was arrested a few more times, put on restrictions even. Couldn't be out of his parents' house between certain hours and unaccompanied by either parent, before he was deported altogether. I didn't keep up with the news on him much more after that. This happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me as no one ever used that door in our house. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time and all of the units had a back door at the top of a narrow staircase. Those doors were a little inconvenient to access as you'd have to go around the building and up the narrow stairs as opposed to the wider and obvious main entrance at the front. It didn't make much sense to use that entrance, and I couldn't think of anyone who might want to visit using it. As I approached the back door slowly, I could see two tall men in the window, standing right outside. A chill went down my spine. I didn't feel safe just opening the door, so I called out instead. Hello? One of the men tapped on the window. Oh, uh, yes, hello. May we come in? We're with Bresnan. At the time, my husband and I had Bresnan for cable, but we weren't having any issues with it. Needless to say, I was very confused. Uh, we're not having any issues at the moment. Is there a problem? Ma'am, can we come in? We're servicing the entire area and it's very important we look at your cable. We're not having any issues, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we're visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our jobs. I noticed the man was now grabbing the doorknob quite fiercely and trying to open the locked door. I slowly grabbed a knife from our knife block and held it close to the chest. We're not having any issues, I repeated, trying not to convey shakiness in my voice. You don't need to be here. The two figures appeared to whisper to each other for a moment, then straighten up. Ma'am, let us in right now. We're on a deadline and we need to do our job. I glanced at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive home from work, and I gripped the knife tighter. Ma'am, ma'am, open up! I saw him try the doorknob once more. I closed my eyes and felt overwhelming gratitude that I'd remembered to lock my doors. Just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Can I at least get your names and badge numbers? I'll give your supervisor a call to let them know everything is fine. I heard a bunch of shuffling outside. Then one of the men replied, No need, ma'am. We're sorry we wasted your time tonight. With that, both of the men ran down the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held the knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company or the police, but my hands were shaking so badly I couldn't grip my phone. With the knife still grasped to my chest and the phone falling out of my other hand, I sank down to the floor and cried. When my husband returned home, I told him what happened. I was still very shaken up and had started crying again after he came home. He immediately called the cable company and spoke to a representative who informed us that no one from their company was out on assignment in our area. The next day, we asked all our neighbors if they'd had a visit as well, but no one had heard anything. I was recently reminded of a not-so-fun moment that happened last year. At the time, I, 24 and female, had the entire lower-slash-main-floor unit I lived in to myself. 
I used to bartend slash manage a nightclub a few blocks away, and would usually get home around 4am or so. This night I had just finished a 12 hour shift. I was exhausted and quite hungry, so I decided to simply order some food. I placed the order, got my joint rolled and ready for when the food arrived, and put on a movie to wait. Eventually, I heard the doorbell ring. Being alone and it being quite late at night, I wanted to get the photo sent to the delivery app to verify my food was actually at the door. I really didn't want to have to make small talk with the driver, as post-COVID, I still kept the option for contactless delivery. Three to five minutes passed by. I got the photo of the food on the doorstep and decided to get up and go get it finally. My bedroom window had five large windows that gave me my full view of the path along the house, the main street in front, our garbage area, and the area right in front of our unit's door. I could see the driver was surprisingly still out there. Now he started texting me to come out and get my food. I told him he left it in a perfect spot, and I'd be out shortly to get it. I told him thanks for delivering it, and that he could go now. At this point, I was just waiting for him to leave. Even though marijuana is legal here, people can still be a bit judgmental. I didn't want to go out in my PJs to collect my food, smoke, and see another human after working all night. He didn't leave, though, no matter how long I waited. He kept on texting me to come outside. Now, as well, I could hear him talking to another male voice. My window view was unfortunately obscuring the other person, though. The food in the photo had been right against my door, but I could see him slowly moving it away and off to the side, so I'd have to fully go out and walk around a small corner to collect it. I kept texting him, telling me it was fine. I was glad he'd followed the instructions and then he could leave now and I'd be out shortly. He began to bang on the front door, still whispering to this other male voice. He moved my food even further away and wouldn't stop banging and demanding me to come outside. Eventually I lied and told him I had COVID and I didn't want him to get sick. After I saw he'd read my message on the app, he put my food right back in front of the front door and walked out through the back parking lot even though initially he'd come in through the front. Something about the entire encounter felt so off. I waited for 15 minutes until I couldn't see or hear anyone. I quickly opened the door and grabbed my food. The entire ordeal lasted an hour. My food was nice and cold, of course. The joint was out of way for another day, and my heart was racing for the rest of the night. Last year, I was on vacation in southern Europe with a large group of friends. We had been there a while and always took an Uber from our rented house to the city, which had very nice bars and clubs. The thing about Uber, though, is it allows very cheap and flexible transport, but it opens the door for quite a lot of creeps. I've had Uber drivers who are super cool, of course, but also extremely drugged up road ragers who drive like maniacs and think they're so impressive. It's always the worst once an attractive woman sits in the car. It feels like a lot of creeps think, now that I have her here in this situation where she can't flee, she has to talk and be nice to me. For that very reason, one of the guys of our group always used their phone to call the Uber, so no creep would pick up the ride specifically because a woman ordered it. Some of my friends even used fake male names because of this. The guy we got this day was by far the worst. It was late in the evening. An Uber picked us up and drove me, 27 and male, my friend, also 27 and male, and two female friends to the desired Old Town, where we planned to go clubbing and drink a bit. While driving, the driver was constantly staring at the two women in the back seat via the mirror. He kept on trying to start conversations as well, only talking to the girls and completely ignoring the guys. The girls gave short, non-detailed answers, of course. To us, he seemed way too pushy. He also didn't seem that big on hygiene, giving off the classic, this exact scenario is why we don't like booking Ubers vibe. Meanwhile, we couldn't wait to arrive at our destination and get out of this uncomfortable but not super bad situation. Boy, did it not feel great, though, when this guy did not stop on the road, but instead pulled into a parking spot. He startled to fumble with his phone. 
We thought it was pretty weird and left, thinking the guy would just leave. To our surprise, though, he turned his car off and started to follow us. Just started walking right alongside us without saying a single word. After 400 feet, we reached the gates. We stopped because this was the meeting spot for the other half of our group, who had taken a separate car. It was around this point that we realized the guy was following a short distance behind us, and he stopped with us as well. You know the classic circle people form while talking? This guy was just kind of standing next to it staring at us because people wouldn't let him in. We started making conversation about how long the others would take to get here, where they were right now, etc. The guy started to get very annoyed apparently. He thought he was part of the posse or something. Oh cool, even more people. Must be a great evening you've got planned. We texted our friends in the group chat that we were changing the meeting place to this bar. The Uber driver was just following us around. One of us started leading the group at a quick pace through the streets. They were very small with lots of people. We took turns at every corner, trying to lose the guy, but he kept on chasing after us. Finally, we reached a big plaza where there were hundreds of other people packed closely together, basically queuing to enter the narrow street up ahead. We pushed through like rude douchebags and successfully lost the guy. Finally, we could just head straight to the bar after our detour and linked up with the other half of our group. Two hours passed by and life was very good. We decided to head to another bar a bit further away because drinks and prices kind of sucked at this one. We'd had two drinks in that bar when guess who walked right through the door and stood next to the table? The Uber guy. Hello, ladies. What's up? At this point, a friend who was good at communicating and very big told the guy that he wanted to keep to ourselves. We had no interest in hanging out with this man. The guy held his hands up. No problem. And he left. Unfortunately, around 3 a.m. while dancing in a crowd, the same man announced his presence by tenderly grabbing the back of one of the girls we had been staring at through the mirror in the car. The girl's boyfriend recognized the guy, got angry as fuck, and grabbed him by the collar. He told him that if he kept following us, we would beat the shit out of him. The bouncer saw this and approached as well. I started talking to the bouncer. At first, he was super annoyed by having to deal with a fight, but after hearing how this guy had stalked us all the way to the club from his car, he asked a few follow-up questions and then proceeded to throw the man out. We stayed a bit longer than we wanted, in hopes of him not waiting for us again. After that, we reported him for being a creep in the app, and called another Uber, which thankfully was not him. This happened about 15 years ago. I was 21 years old and living in my very first apartment. It was a small bachelor apartment in a fairly sketchy area. I grew up in a town that was known to be rough and tough, I knew how to handle myself because of this and learned at a young age to keep my head down and not go looking for trouble. My apartment building was behind a bar. A lot of the customers would stand outside to smoke. When they did, they would always be looking at my apartment. Most of the people who were out smoking kept to themselves. A few would nod and say hello if I happened to be there. Never really any issues until one evening. One evening, I arrived home from work and passed by the bar where I saw an extremely tall man outside smoking. As I passed by, I could feel him staring at me. I gave him a slight nod, but he didn't acknowledge me at all, just continued to stare. It was a bit weird, but I didn't really think that much of it. Maybe he was just lost in thought or something. About an hour later, though, I heard a sudden knock at my door. This was very odd because you had to buzz people in to the building. The building only had eight units and I didn't really know any of the neighbors, so I had no idea who this could be. I froze because I really didn't want to talk to anyone, but the knocking continued. Finally, I called out. Who is it? There was no response. I called out again. Who's there? It's me. It's Tom. I didn't know anyone named Tom so I shouted back. I don't know anyone called that. You must have the wrong apartment. What he said next chilled me. You may not know me, but I sure know you. Open up, we can talk a bit. I went over to the peephole 
and saw it was that tall man from the bar. Fuck off or I'm calling the cops. I heard his footsteps walk away slightly. Then I heard the building door open and close. At least he'd left without much fuss. Or so I thought. A few minutes later, I peeked out the window, only to see he was standing in the parking lot. He seemed to be whispering something to himself, walking around and looking crazed. At this point, I was freaking out. I called my landlord who lived in the building next to me. He told me to call the police, and in the meantime, he and his brother would come to check things out. I called the cops and told them what was happening. They said a car was on the way. Meanwhile, my landlord and his brother made their way to the parking lot. I watched out the window and saw them approach the tall man. He took one look at them and bolted into the night. My landlord and his brother tried to chase him, but the man got away. About five minutes later, the police arrived. I gave my version of events and also a description of the man. The officer then told me this. We've had reports of a man matching that description who's been sexually assaulting women in the area. Thank God you didn't open the door. A few days later, I got a call from the officer. He told me part of their investigation was talking to the owner of the bar. The owner called the police when the tall dude reappeared after a few days, and the police responded and swiftly arrested him. I used to fight with my parents a lot as a teenager. That led to them kicking me out once I graduated high school. I was almost 19 at that point. For me, that wasn't much of a problem. I had my own job, my own cheap car, and my friend's parents had a spare bedroom. They were willing to let me rent out for a while. It worked out just fine for me. This being said, I will change all the names. Let's call my friend Kelly and her mom Lena. Her dad is Kenneth. Kenneth and Lena had a lot of weird friends due to the fact they were quite fierce partiers. A lot of these friends were genuinely nice people, just a little bit weird. You could tell they had issues such as drugs or criminal pasts. But none of them were bad or mean or creepy or anything like that. There was one particular guy though that was just beyond weird. Just someone who, even though I didn't know him at all, he made my skin crawl the moment I looked at him. We'll call him Joey. I came home from work one day, and the only person there at our house was Joey. As soon as I walked in, he said hello, then made some comment about how beautiful I was. I don't consider myself good looking in the slightest, so I just kind of said thanks and walked off to start doing my normal routine. As I was making my lunch and cleaning up my mess, I could feel someone staring at me from behind. It was Joey. He'd followed me into the kitchen and was now blocking the only doorway, just standing there watching me. I asked him if I could get him anything, but he shook his head and continued to watch me. This made me very uncomfortable, of course. I kind of shoved him out of the way and fled for my room. I locked the door until I heard everyone else get home. Joey finally left around dinner time. I thought it was fine and went about my nightly routine and went to bed as usual. He must have come back at some point though because he was sitting at the breakfast table when I went down to get my cereal. Again, the whole time he just stared daggers at me so I took my food to my room instead. Friday night rolled around. Lena, Kenneth, and Kelly told me they were going to throw this huge party and I should invite whoever I wanted. I just had a gut feeling though that Joey was going to be there. I invited the most intimidating male person I could think of, my neighbor Charles. He was a pretty huge guy, around six foot five or so. He was also covered nearly head to toe in tattoos and happened to be an ex-Hell's Angel. He was the type that, unless provoked, wouldn't hurt anybody. I explained by inviting him the day before about how Joey was behaving. What he told me scared the shit out of me. Turns out he actually knew Joey. Apparently, he was on the run from the police for raping some teenage girls the year before and said I needed to stay as far away from him as possible no matter what. You'd think that would be where the scary part ended, but no, it gets worse. I'm usually not a cop caller myself since I can hang with an unsavory crowd sometimes, but I went straight home, packed all my things, left to a safe place, and called the police. 
Here's the worst part. When they finally arrested him, they took a look through his phone. I don't know how the hell he managed this, but he had multiple pictures of me on it. Most of them were of me sleeping, or me in the shower or using the bathroom. He had texts to another person about me, and about what they were planning to do with me when he got the opportunity. I no longer talk to Kelly or her parents, and when someone gives me a bad vibe, I instantly get away from them. I'll forever be grateful to Charles as well, because he might have just saved my life by letting me know all that. This story happened back in the 90s to my parents during their senior year of high school. Since their group of friends already had cars, the favorite thing they loved to do was night hiking around the state's local mental hospital, mainly its old dairy farm. This was located right on the side of a mountain, surrounded by agricultural fields and an open grassland. Since the dairy farm was not that close to the mental hospital, and the nearest city life was located about five miles away. That area at night was extra dark and quiet. Before the farm was closed down, the patients from the mental hospital would often go there for work. During this time, some of the patients lost their lives in this location due to accidents. By the 90s, it was completely abandoned, left there like a ghost town, especially due to the rumors of it being haunted. It made the perfect place for a fearful experience. This particular night around 2 in the morning, my dad, my mom, four of their female friends, and one of their male friends planned to go down to the old farm. They took two cars, and when they got to the usual parking spot on the side of the mountain, they saw there was already a group of 20 or so people standing there. When my parents and their friends got out of their cars, they noticed that this group of men all had shaved heads, were Caucasian, and in their mid-twenties. As my parents walked past them, both groups did their best to ignore each other and avoided making eye contact. My mom, however, turned her head to see one of the men. As she did this, the man pulled back his jacket and showed off a pistol tucked in his pants. Then he pulled back his lower lips, which revealed he had a KKK tattooed on his bottom lip, when they were out of hearing range, my mom whispered to my dad, That guy had a gun, and he has KKK tattooed on him. My dad brushed it off, thinking my mom was over-exaggerating. He said it was too dark to even notice such things. With that, my parents and their friends walked through the grassland to get to the farm. The hike to get there was about a half a mile from where they'd parked. However, as soon as they got to the farm... They heard gunshots ringing out from the direction of the cars. Fearing that something had happened, they booked it back to the parking lot. When they got back, the group of men were already gone. As they inspected their cars, though, they saw all of their tires had been slashed, and their windows had been broken and smashed in, too. My dad had his stereo stolen, as well as a particular colored blanket he used as a seat cover. Now they just stood there by their cars, wondering what to do next. It's not like they could just call somebody for help. No one had a cell phone at that time. Since they were so deep in a secluded area too, it's not like they could flag someone down for a quick pickup. The nearest gas station with a payphone was five miles away. Both my dad and his male friend didn't want to leave the cars alone. They feared the men would come back. Eventually, it was decided amongst everyone that sending both the men to run to the payphone was the best option, leaving the women by themselves with the cars. This was because they feared the shaved men might be waiting down the road, expecting them to walk to the payphone. My dad and his friend did their best to run to the gas station. As they left, my mom and her friends all gathered up heavy rocks to use as some sort of protective weapon and hid away in the bushes behind the trees. Two hours passed by, when my mom noticed headlights coming down the road, two tow trucks rolled into the parking spot. An immense fear began to spread throughout the group until they saw that my dad and his brothers came out of the tow trucks. They hooked up the cars and were out of there in a matter of minutes. My dad told my mom as they were running down that dark and empty road, they'd kept their eyes open, 
just in case the men were hiding with their car's lights off. Luckily, they got to the gas station without much problem. The next part may be a bit hard to believe, but it's 100% true. Two weeks had passed by since, and my dad managed to get his car fully repaired and drivable again. My mom and dad were driving to the local store when they parked and got out of the car. As they were walking, a man began to come towards them. As he got closer, my mom realized it was the same shaved-headed man who had flashed the gun at her. My mom immediately told this to my dad, but just like the first time, my dad denied this was true. Two weeks later, at the very same store, my mom and dad were sitting in their car when my mom saw a car pull up next to them. As the man got out and stood there, she noticed it was the same man once again. My mom immediately told this to my dad. Again, he denied it. My mom looked once more into his car, though, and saw the very recognizable blanket my dad had used as a seat cover. That's when my dumbass dad finally connected the dots and got out of the car to confront the man. The man, realizing they'd recognized him, jumped back into his car and drove away. They didn't have time to get the plate numbers. The next week, when my dad was filling gas into his car, a car pulled up right behind him. Lo and behold, the same man again. My dad went to get into the guy's face ready to confront him. One of the man's friends got out of the car and pulled out a gun on him. The man with the gun told everyone to get inside, and that group drove away. It's been almost 30 years since then, and they've never seen those men since. My family and I went on a trip to the Hawking Hills area of Southern Ohio just a few weeks ago. There was a place I always wanted to visit. The abandoned ghost town Moonville Rail Tunnel. I had never been to this area, so I didn't know what to expect. I did know it was pretty deep in the woods though. We took a trip from our rented cabin, using Google GPS to get to the location. We started driving, and it was, for lack of a better word, a real impoverished area. It had a very Hills Have Eyes-esque ambiance. We literally only saw like two cars on the way there, and on the back roads as well. We got to a point where we needed to enter the forest, and were close by to the tunnel. There was a sign that said we were entering Bubba Wood. For a little more additional information, I drive a Mercedes that I'm lucky to have and my husband was in the car. He's a black man with dreadlocks, and I had my 10-year-old non-verbal autistic son with me as well, and my 6-year-old daughter too. We drove down this real creepy stone road into the forest. There was nothing back there. No cars, no houses, not a single person. We did see signs we were close though, and pulled into the parking lot. There was a footbridge that people had built there, we walked over the footbridge and made our way toward the tunnel, which was a lot larger than I'd expected. All of a sudden, we heard this sound coming from the other side of the tunnel, into the woods away from the parking lot. A truck came driving towards us while we were on foot. The truck stopped in the middle of the tunnel. The person got out of their truck with a chainsaw. I could see it was a white guy in his 60s. He started to walk after my family, following us everywhere we went through the tunnel. I tried to call out to him and pull some info about if he worked for the Department of Natural Resources or something, but he wouldn't say a single word. As we turned around to leave, he started to rev up his chainsaw behind us. The sound echoed throughout the tunnel. At this point, we had no cell phone service, and literally no one knew my family was out there except for us. I was already worried my car might be sending the wrong idea to people, like we were some naive folks with money or something. We didn't have much. We rushed back to the car to get the kids in their booster seats. This motherfucker jumped back into his car and drove over the footbridge in his truck towards us, following us to the parking lot. Honestly, I don't even know how his truck fit onto that bridge. He stopped again and got out of his truck. About this point, I noticed there were some dusty handprints on my car. I asked my husband if they were his. We compared his hand and my son's and they were not a match. I don't know who would have been touching the car, because we were watching the chainsaw man the entire time we were there. Needless to say, we got out of there as fast as possible. Just a few minutes later though, I looked back into my rear view mirror, only to see a bunch of dust kicking up behind us. 
There he is. He had driven pretty fast on the stone road to catch up to us. There was nowhere to go in these woods. The road was basically one lane, and we still had no GPS. Every time I thought we would lose him, he would turn up behind us once again. I was just waiting for my tires to pop on a trap or something, or for this guy to speed up and ram me off the road into a ravine. Finally, we emerged from the woods. I turned around, only to see he was still following us. We were following printed directions to get back, and I ended up making a wrong turn in all the excitement. Surprisingly, the guy on the truck did not follow us. I turned around to go back past the stone road that went into the forest and take a different way. There was one lone house near this road, and to my surprise, I saw his truck parked right there. He had to have seen us drive into the road in the woods and taken some way back to the tunnel. I don't know if he was trying to protect the site from some graffiti or what, but that was really scary. It was like every scary movie trope rolled into one single event. Me, my ex-boyfriend, and another friend had been visiting some friends up north. We live in Germany, and I and one of the friends we were visiting are Wiccans. A holiday was coming up soon, so we asked our friends to join us for a little ritual. For this, we needed some corn leaves. We went down on the quest to gather some. It was pitch black and probably about 11pm or so. We were already well out of the city and in the middle of nowhere on a path between fields. There were four people there, including me. I was holding the only flashlight. Everyone had a beer and music going, and the mood was fairly good. Nobody was scared at all. All of a sudden, though, my friend, who was walking slightly in front of me, stopped and said, I think something's walking there. I got this instant chill coming over me. As we all stopped, I began to hear something rustling in the high grass besides the path. A scream rang out in the night. The kind of scream you'd make while being stabbed to death. But it wasn't coming from any of us. I don't know why I just froze there. I just got scared from zero to 100 in a single millisecond. My friend said, uh, it's okay. I'm sure it's just a deer. The others tried to reaffirm as well. Yeah, yeah, it's just a deer. I was calming down pretty fast because I was thinking to myself, okay, yeah, that makes sense, I guess. The rustling started up again, though. I shined my light out into the grass, but I didn't see anything. Nothing. I thought I should have been able to see a deer because I was holding the flashlight and pointing it right in there. I should have seen something. The grass on both sides was obviously moving and rustling, but I couldn't see anything there. I began to scream because I was so scared. My friend pointed out that she'd seen something standing at the side of the road, then suddenly crawling across. I still had not seen anything myself. She began to scream too. The other two were too scared to say anything at all. I was already hysterical and crying and screaming when we heard the rustling now closer than ever and what sounded like giggling, like an evil, malicious giggling. I'm truly not trying to be dramatic here. We all confirmed afterwards that that's exactly what we'd heard. I was starting to have a little bit of a panic attack. I was crying and the others were scared as well. We just started to book it back to town. I swear, in the single moment I looked behind me, it looked like there was someone crouching in the grass smiling. I'd never run that fast in my entire life. It certainly wasn't a deer, I'll tell you that. Why they'd giggled like that and stalked us in the grass, I have no idea. My friend and I both just don't know what we should think about this event. I would say it was pretty damn spooky though. Sorry, this turned into a bit more of a written piece than I expected it to become but this is one of those stories that my husband and I trot out occasionally to this day. It wasn't exactly in the woods. I guess it kind of was. As best we could tell, it was on uninhabited land that was surrounded by forests on all sides, but was not part of the woods itself. Woods adjacent, I guess I'd say. Most of my family, for the longest time, was centrally located in Florida, 
going back for many generations. That's changed as people have gotten older and passed on, of course, and needed to move out to different places due to the job market in the state stagnating. Back during this time, though, I was sort of the black sheep of the family for being one of the only few to get out of there. I still tried to make trips down there to see them when I could, though, when time and money allowed for it. I was still in my early 20s and trying to keep my head above water financially. For this particular trip, I decided to introduce my then boyfriend and now husband to all of my family, on top of for once having company on an extended road trip. It was also time for us to test out our shiny newfangled GPS to get us where we were going. It had been long enough since my last journey that I didn't really trust my memory to lead me through Florida's roads anymore. Not until I was in my home city proper, at least. Well, it turned out to be an entertainingly terrible trip. We were hit by a thick fog and rain at the state border, to the point where the visibility was literally zero. For one of the few times I'd ever seen in that state, we also began to get pelted by hail in big enough pieces that it broke my car's wipers. After debating whether we wanted a chance trying to find a place to pick up a replacement, and essentially having to navigate this terrible weather with an increasingly shaky GPS device. In the middle of the night, we decided to keep on trucking. I made do with what visibility I could. I figured being able to read the road signs wouldn't matter so much, since we had our computerized road map giving us instructions. That's what I thought at least. At some point, that calm, mechanical voice instructed us to make an unexpected turn off the main road. After a little bit of back and forth with my SO, we jokingly decided to go with the flow and take it. What was the worst that could happen? We figured that if it led us the wrong way, we could easily make a U-turn if it was off the mark. For all we knew, it was operating with information about some kind of road obstruction or accident we couldn't see yet. The weather was still absolute crap after all. We drove for a good amount of distance. Within the first couple of miles, every other bit of traffic dropped off. A few minutes and another turn later, the road made an abrupt transition from concrete to gravel. I shrugged my shoulders. At least it would be a somewhat entertaining dog leg in our trip, even if I still couldn't see any of the landscape in this soupy weather. I told my SO to keep his eyes peeled for a good place to turn around, since our two-lane road had just turned into an unpaved one-lane path with a ditch running along each side. It was surrounded by increasingly heavy tree line as well. One point of silvery lining, I suppose, is that the horrible spew falling from the sky at this point finally paused a bit, giving us a bit of relief. I was not so afraid of getting our car stuck in the mud while making a turnaround now. This also meant we now had an unobstructed view of the woods as they broke on one side of us. This revealed what looked to be an old farmhouse, sticking out like a sore thumb. We went absolutely silent when we saw this thing. The GPS stopped working at this point. It looked very abandoned, which in itself was not unexpected. Florida backcountry, as I was familiar with, tended to be flat as a pancake, with fields and sporadic wooded sections. Every once in a while, you get some abandoned building usually from someone who owned more land than they could maintain, or couldn't afford to keep up anymore. This fit the bill with its empty broken windows and peeling whitewash boards. It had a surprisingly well-maintained clear space around it, though, a decently sized yard, and festooned around that clear space, sometimes sitting up on pieces of raggedy furniture or set up in little dioramas on the saggy porch of the building, or dolls, Thousands of varyingly shaped dolls, sometimes marionettes or cabbage patch style, human-sized mannequins set on rocking chairs so it stared at you not five feet from the road. This was especially disorienting because all of the fog hadn't fully cleared yet, so we could only see this head and shoulders emerging from the mush before you got closer and saw it wasn't actually a person. I'm not ashamed to say I veered over as sharply as I could on that narrow path because it fooled me for a handful of seconds. We were both rubbernecking like crazy as we passed this by. The more we observed, the more we could see all the attention to details someone went through to set everything up. The dolls were all sitting at tiny doll-sized tables, 
having tea with one another. Some of them had very elaborate clothes. Some even had hair, but they were all slumped on the ground like they'd been forgotten. Others were very purposefully placed. I can't imagine how much effort that would have taken. We passed by without a single word said, and waited until it finally veered out of our sight. Then I turned us around regardless of how narrow this path still was. We had come to the consensus that our side trip down this unknown road was now done. When we went by that doll house again, I was going about as quickly as I judged our car could go. I'm sure everyone else got another good eyeful the second time around. Nowadays, we still occasionally reference that doll house when talking about trips to Florida. It's definitely one of those things you find entertaining from several states away, but not with a dead-eyed mannequin staring directly at your car as you drive past in the fog. This happened to me a few years ago. I worked second shift at the time, getting off at midnight. I would sometimes hit up Denny's after work for a late night dinner. One night, I'm sitting there in a booth, just reading my book and eating my dinner. When I look up and notice a guy at another table, sitting all by himself in the corner, just staring at me. I didn't really think too much of it at first. Maybe he just liked late night people watching or something. We made eye contact for a moment, and he immediately looked away. A while later, I sense something and look up, only to see that same guy staring at me again. Exact same thing happened too. Eye contact, then he looked away. At this point, my instincts started to twinge a bit. He hadn't come over to me or anything though, so I let it go. I just tried to finish up my eating as quickly as possible and pay at the register. The man immediately got up to pay right behind me. Now I was starting to get a little creeped out. After I paid, I moved over to the side, pretending to be searching for something in my purse. He lingered around for a moment, waiting to see if I'd stay there longer, then left the building. I waited ten minutes to leave, cursing at myself that I'd parked over at the side of the building instead of the windowed front. If this happened today, I'd probably simply ask an employee to walk me out, but I was young and didn't want to inconvenience anyone. I walked out to my car on high alert and got in. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, his car pulled in right next to mine and he started to get out. I was really freaked out at this point. I hit my door locks and backed out of my parking space. There were two ways to exit the lot. A driveway a few feet away, going directly onto the service road, which would take me right past his car. Or I could go around the building and cross over into the next door Waffle House's parking lot and exit their driveway. I chose to go around the building. When it was clear I was going to leave quickly, the man jumped back into his car and began to follow me. I was panicking now. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to go home, as I didn't want this guy to know where I lived. Luckily, that Waffle House next door had a front wall full of windows and a parking space open right in the front. I pulled into the spot as swiftly as I could, jumped out of my car, and ran into the building. I looked back outside, only to see his car stop behind mine in the middle of the lane. There was this enraged look on his face. At this point, I was shaking and nearly hyperventilating. The waitresses were seriously nice. They asked me what was wrong, and I stuttered out I was being followed. One of the waitresses came around the counter and stood next to me. She stared down that car creep until he drove off. She sat me down in a booth and gave me a cup of coffee for free, telling me to wait a while before heading out home. I left about 20 minutes later. I watched every car on the road to make sure that guy was not following me. I never went back to that area after work again, though I did write a thank you note to the waitresses and dropped it off during the day. It scared the shit out of me. To this day, the thing that makes me angry about this was, after telling some friends what happened, a couple of them tried to convince me the man must have thought I was cute and just wanted to talk to me. They didn't see that guy's face when I got to safety. I could tell he wanted to hurt me. Thankfully, he never got the chance.
I don't tell this story often, because even in the 2020s, when it's less and less acceptable to victim blame, I don't like having to answer questions like, well, what time was it? Or, what were you wearing? I went to college in a sleepy town near the US-Mexico border, with 100,000 people. It was small enough to know many people around, but big enough that the new faces didn't really stand out much. I liked to frequent this walking trail that ran alongside a main road in town. The street was well driven, and the path well used by runners, walkers, bikers, and people out with their strollers. Unless you're there near 11 at night, like I was the last time I ever walked it. I was about half a mile away from home. I had my headphones plugged in, and was walking to clear my head of some particularly stubborn anxiety. Ironically, fear that something bad was going to happen to me. A car, I can't tell you what kind it was, slowed down as they saw me. At the time, I could have sworn it was a black Mustang, specifically just like the one a friend of mine drove. I approached the car thinking it was that very same friend. You know, it was a smallish town, not uncommon to run into them while out and about. As I got a bit closer though, I could tell right away this was not my friend. It was a man I'd never seen before. Shaved head, glasses, some sort of yellow graphic t-shirt. I distinctly remember he looked like my Uncle Dan. I stopped in place, even took a step back actually. I could see his lips were moving, but I couldn't quite hear what he was saying. Being the painfully polite person I was, I took a step closer to hear him better. Now I could make out him saying something about the word campus. Was he asking for directions to the campus? He nodded affirmatively. Well, uh, which campus are you looking for, sir? The community college or the university? He stumbled about, clearly not having prepared enough to know he would be asked this simple question. He stammered out the name of the university in a way that made my head tell me he clearly had never even been there. Nonetheless, I told him he wasn't far away. He would need to turn around and go straight three or four miles. He began to mumble more words to himself that I still couldn't make out. I called out to him once more. What are you trying to say, sir? My heart was pounding. I could tell something was off about this guy, but I didn't quite know what it was. I'd been staring at his face this whole time trying to figure it out. It wasn't until I took one last step forward that I noticed the way his hand was sitting and what he was holding in his lap. He flashed his handgun at me. As soon as he saw I'd noticed it, he said in a now perfectly audible voice, Get in the car now! I completely froze. I couldn't run, I couldn't scream. Most assuredly I wouldn't comply. I just stopped functioning altogether. Again, this time he flashed his gun directly at me. Get in the fucking car! He was getting nervous now. His hand was twitching on the trigger. To this day, I can't explain why my brain chose to have me turn around and run away from the car. I heard the car start behind me, and somehow I knew this would be the end for me. He was turning around to get me. I couldn't bear to watch. Nobody would come to help me if I screamed. I was all alone now. I stopped running and just walked, resigned. In that moment, I had given up altogether. I can't really tell you why. Instead of turning around though, he noticed another car coming down the road and slammed down on the gas and fled, leaving me there shaking a profoundly vulnerable mess. Enough wit returned after a minute or so for me to call 911. Some cop cars showed up shortly thereafter and they took my statement. I remember thinking the cops didn't believe me. One said I was pretty calm for someone who was almost abducted. I was even feebly making jokes. For months after that, I scoured the internet, looking for news stories about missing women or attempted abductions, hoping I would find a mugshot with his face on it. But I never did find one. That means there's a chance he's still out there, going to college towns he has no business in, asking for directions, looking like people's uncles. As for me, I'd be glad to never have to interact with him again. This is more of a warning to people who live alone than anything else, but the memory of it still creeps the ever-loving shit out of me. 
A few years back, I lived in an apartment complex. It was not in a particularly bad part of town either. In fact, I'd lucked out even, somehow managing to move into the same building as a handful of friends of mine. I thought this was perfect. A couple of months after living there though, I started to notice some things going missing. It was never anything big like my laptop or my Xbox or my TV. It would be smaller things. An iPod, a disposable camera, a couple of other small things just vanishing here and there. I'd often knew I'd left them out in the open on the counter or something, but then they'd just be gone. I figured I'd just misplace them, because again, they were fairly small items. A few times I'd get ready to leave, only to find my bottom lock already locked. Now, personally, I don't put much stock in doorknob locks. They're fairly flimsy and easy to pick anyway, and not really worth the effort. I only really ever use deadbolts and the like. When people would come over, I'd close the door behind them, and lock the deadbolt, of course. That was a reflex, even when I was home alone. That part of the door would be locked, but I'd never lock the knob itself. I just felt safer that way. The deadbolt had no keyhole on the other side of the door for someone to pick or anything like that, after all. Three times I noticed the doorknob was locked when I went to leave the house, even though I myself never used it. I rationalized that perhaps when going to lock the deadbolt, I just locked that too out of instinct. I mean, what else could it be? Well, one day, after living there for about seven months now, I'm just sitting there in my living room when I hear some shuffling by my front door. Since my apartment was a one-bedroom and fairly small, I could easily hear this through the walls. I got up and moved a bit closer, standing maybe four feet away from the door. My heart immediately sank as I watched the doorknob begin to twist ever so slowly. It turned and turned, and then the door pushed in, only to be stopped in place by my deadbolt. At an agonizingly slow pace, the person on the other side of the door pulled it closed. They clicked it softly shut, and I watched and listened as they slid a key into my lock and locked the doorknob themselves. I didn't know what to do. Have you ever seen something that just restarts your brain? It's so unfathomable that you just can't take in any more information in the moment. That's exactly what this was. I wish I could say I snuck up to the door and banged against it, scaring the shit out of whoever was on the other side. But of course, that's not what happened. I didn't do anything because my brain couldn't actually comprehend that someone with a key was trying to get into my apartment while I was still home. The only thing that had saved me in that moment was my deadbolt. And before anyone suggests it was one of my aforementioned friends or my husband with a spare key or something, no, I had the only two copies of my key because my husband was deployed at the time. Not even my family had a spare. Everything sort of snapped into place after that. Someone had been sneaking into my apartment, stealing my shit and doing God knows what while I was gone, then locking the door behind them. They'd attempted to do this while I was there, too, locking my doorknob. How many times had they been in my apartment when I wasn't home? There was no way for me to know, because like I said before, I can't lock the deadbolt from outside. Logically, I knew it had to be someone who worked in the office, a maintenance man most likely, but since I hadn't looked through the peephole in that moment, I couldn't figure out which of the four guys who worked there it was. Crazily enough, about six months after finally moving out, a friend who still lived there told me that all of the maintenance men had been fired because all of them were reported for creeping around apartments and suspected of stealing as well. While this might not be outright terrifying like some stories, it's still pretty scary. Another reminder to always lock your doors in multiple ways, even when you're already home. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in the comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, 
There will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.